Hello, Magic Casters of all shapes and sizes! My name is Chance, welcome to my spellbook, and thank you for taking a look at the 28th episode of our third level spell series. Man, do we have a doozy in store for us today. I tell ya, I have not been looking forward to doing this spell literally since I started the channel. It's always been a... Uh, an avatar of death, I suppose you could say. Is it particularly difficult to defeat? Eh, debatable. But is it hard to hit and do properly? Oh, heck yes. And it's a self-inflicted pain, so I can't even get mad about it. In any case, today we are taking a look at Glyph of Warding. This spell is usable by the Bard, Cleric, Wizard, and the Artificer, and it is found in the Player's Handbook. Let me tell ya... Ooh, this spell. Been, it's been a real pain in my neck for a long time. But before we dive into it, I want to let you guys know I do have another channel, Chance's Guide to Pathfinder 2E. I strongly suggest you check it out. It would mean the world to me if you could subscribe to it. That being said, let's dive into the mechanics behind Glyph of Warding. So I had to change up the format a little bit here just so I could fit all this in, but the effect at a glance is as followed. Place a symbol that requires an investigation check to detect. The symbol can be no larger than 10 feet and cannot be moved more than 10 feet from where it was cast. The symbol either explodes or releases a spell when set conditions are met. The Explosive Ruin deals 5d8 elemental damage, half as much on a successful dexterity save, and you determine what kind of elemental damage it is. In the Spell Glyph, the spell must be of 3rd level or lower, targeting either a creature or area, which is most spells. The cast time is 1 hour and it is not concentration. The spell actually plays with the term concentration quite a bit, and we will get into that a little bit more later on. The range is touch which is really cool because technically it means your familiar can cast it as well uh, the duration is until dispelled or triggered at higher levels the explosive rune deals an extra 1d8 per slot level and the spell glyph stored a spell up to the level used the components are the holy trinity of verbal material and somatic if you are curious about the material component it is incense and powdered diamond worth at least 200 gold piece which the spell does consume and the school is abjuration unsurprisingly this spell is super cool from a mechanical angle. I know the effect looks a little bit long, but let me tell you, it is nothing compared to the ever sprawling hellscape that is this spell's actual description. Wizards of the Coast, why you gotta do me like this? Seriously, this thing's a novel. Once again, a quick reminder, please do subscribe to this channel and the other channel as well. I really don't want to have to keep reminding you guys, but until I hit my thousand subscriber quota on the other channel, I'm gonna quick keep reminding you. So if you don't want me to, just subscribe and let it be over with like a band-aid. But in any case, let's now check out the full, unbridled, untamed, and unrelenting description of this spell. Buckle in, guys, because it's going to be a long ride. When you cast this spell, you inscribe a glyph that later unleashes a magical effect. You inscribe it either on a surface, such as a table or section of floor or wall, or within an object that can be closed, such as a book, a scroll, or a treasure chest, to conceal the glyph. The glyph can cover an area no larger than 10 feet in diameter. If the surface or object is moved more than 10 feet from where you cast this spell, the glyph is broken and the spell ends without being triggered. The glyph is nearly invisible and requires a successful investigation check against your spell save DC to be found. You decide what triggers the glyph when you cast this spell. For glyphs inscribed on a surface, the most typical trigger includes touching or standing on the glyph, removing another object covering the glyph, approaching within a certain distance of the glyph, or manipulating the object on which the glyph is inscribed. For glyphs 
triggers inscribed within an object, the most common triggers include opening that object, approaching within a certain distance of the object, or seeing or reading the glyph. Once a glyph is triggered, the spell ends. You can further refine the trigger so the spell activates only under certain circumstances or according to physical characteristics such as height or weight, creature kind, for example, the ward could be set to affect aberrations or drow, or alignment, which is really interesting by the way. You can also set conditions for creatures that don't trigger the glyph, such as those who say a certain password. When you inscribe the glyph, choose explicitly. Explosive Ruin or a Spell Glyph. Explosive Ruins. When triggered, the glyph erupts with magical energy in a 20 foot radius sphere centered on the glyph. The sphere spreads around corners. Each creature in the area must make a dexterity saving throw. A creature takes a 5d8 acid, cold, fire, lightning, or thunder damage on a failed saving throw, your choice when you create the glyph, or half as much damage on a successful one. Spell Glyph. You can store prepared spell of third level or lower in the glyph by casting as part of creating the glyph. This spell must target a single creature or area. The spell being stored has no immediate effect when cast in this way. Then, when the glyph is triggered, the stored spell is cast. If the spell has a target, it targets the creature that the glyph is triggered by. If the spell affects an area, the area is centered on that creature. If the spell summons hostile creatures or creates harmful objects or traps, they appear as close to the possible intruder and attack it. If the spell requires concentration, it lasts until the end of its full duration, which is also really interesting. At higher levels, when you cast this spell using a spell slot of 4th level or higher, the damage of the explosive ruin and glyph increases by 1d8 per each slot level above 3rd. If you create a spell glyph, you can store any spell up to the same level as a slot used for the glyph of warding. My goodness, we are done more or less officially. So, in general, you put a symbol somewhere or in something, you set the trigger to what happens when, to basically whatever activates it, you pick whether or not it's an explosive ruin or a spell glyph, and, it's, and if someone else wants to spot it, it's investigation versus their spell save DC. The symbol can't be any larger than 10 feet. Honestly, I don't know why you'd want to make it super large to begin with. It seems like smaller is the better in this case, but whatever. And it can't be moved more than 10 feet away from the initial area in which it was cast. Now a couple interesting things worth going over. This is one of the only spells in the game that outright says it can detect alignment in one way or another. It's very interesting. I really do like it when people use it in that way. However, is it worth a third level spell slot just to figure out someone's alignment? You know, depends on the campaign. However, another really interesting thing about this spell is it basically circumvents the need for concentration. And because of that, there's an argument to be made that if it was used for something like, oh, I don't know, Sphere of Flames, for example, you could still control the sphere around without needing to concentrate on it. It really is an interesting bit of wordplay and you do have to do some mental gymnastics to kind of justify it, but based on the way it's worded, it certainly seems to imply that. Actually, maybe Sphere of Flames was a, was a bad example just because you can't... Uh, the spell has to affect a single target or an area, so maybe something like Crown of Madness might be a better example, but still... It really does play interestingly into the whole concentration realm. Once again, is it really worth using that kind of a spell slot? You know, it depends on the campaign. Another thing that is certainly worth noting is the fact that this costs 200 gold piece every time you want to cast it. So if you're in a more kind of financially tight campaign, for lack of a better term, this is not going to be a spell you're going to want to pop out all the time. That being said, between the fact that it is a touch spell so your familiar can use it, between the fact that it can circumvent concentration, and also factoring in the fact that it can detect alignment, this is arguably the best multi-purpose spell in the entire game. 
and because of that this next part is gonna be really tricky let's check out some alternative uses before we do be sure to subscribe to both this ch channel and the other one i'm gonna keep reminding you guys until that channel hits a thousand subscribers so bear with me i don't want to do it but you know kind of got to get results that being said let's check out some alternative uses here so in doing research for this particular video which was exhausting in of itself there have been a couple people who theorize you can actually use this spell in conjunction with magic mouth and a couple illusionary magics to create a literal computer the biggest problem with this as far as i've been able to tell is the duration is until dispelled or triggered However, what happens if you set up a Glyph of Warding to create another Glyph of Warding that creates a Glyph of Warding, and then you set a Magic Mouth to respond to the Glyph of Warding, which in turn triggers something else, it, it, it's very difficult, lots of mental gymnastics involved. If you plan on pulling any nonsense like that, run it past your DM, because holy heck, I can barely understand it, and I went down a pretty deep rabbit hole to try to figure it out for you guys, but just know that some people think it's possible. A great use, however, is to booby trap a spellbook with this. This is especially useful against higher level magic casters, great way of catching them off guard, or even liches hop into their phylactery or their arcanum or any place like that, walk up to their favorite book, spam glyph of warding into it make it a explosion ruin or whatever and just walk away and play the waiting game odds are they're gonna open it and when they do bam you're looking at potentially double digits of d8s coming straight their way i think that would be pretty awesome and a third way to use this is to use it as more of a triggering mechanism for a greater plan once again kind of stitching together triggering components I think this makes a lot more sense. Is it worth the investment? Who knows? But I think like a landmine field would be a kind of a cool setup, not just for players, but for DMs as well. That being said, let me know what you think of Glyph of Warding down beneath in the comments section. Be sure to mention any thoughts, questions, comments, or concerns you have about this spell. I'm expecting you guys are gonna have a lot of questions about it. I do as well, to be honest. I don't think there's a cap on the amount of ways the spell can be used. So let me know what your most convenient or most creative uses rather down beneath in the comment section. And once again, be sure to subscribe to this channel and the second channel. I'm gonna keep reminding you until it's a thousand and then I'll stop, I promise. But that being said, I hope you have a great day and as always, happy casting everyone.